Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Colonized Minds, the podcast. This is Elizabeth Guzman Arroyo. And this is Luke Gibbons. All right. And today we're going to be talking about academic writing, actually. Oh, lovely. So the reason that's been on my head lately is because, well, I've had to do a lot of that lately. Um, and there's just different things that I notice that are deficits within the, the writing model and that are kind of uh, limiting and in some ways counterproductive, but also like... Um, Stupid. Yeah, but there's another word. A it's waste like, of time. <laughs> it's like a feeling like of like um, demeaning. Oh, disempowering, yeah. D- demeaning, disempowering, yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, because with academic writing, you you can't really use original thought unless it's backed by research. And so it's kind of like you have to cite every everything that you say. You know, there's some people who would say that's a good thing, right? Right. I know. <laughs> well, no, wait, OK, so so provide some context as to where this where this comes from. Like this. Um, you got issues with academic writing. Full disclosure. I have issues with academic writing. But where where are your issues with academic writing coming from? One of my issues with academic writing is I have background knowledge on systems of oppression or racism or sexism and how it manifests in society or how you can see it in higher ed, right? And that a lot of it is through personal experience um, of working within higher ed, of working with students, with other colleagues. It hasn't necessarily been from like a book or a well, you know, well-known academic in our, in our area of study. So then when I write papers, I'm expected to cite where I get this information from. Now that's okay. The issue then lies that when I ask questions of like, how do I cite something that I learned through experience? The response is, oh, just Google someone, someone had to have said it before you and then just cite them, even though I didn't actually gain that information from those individuals. So that's one of my issues with academic writing. It's that need of finding someone who said it before you to validate your thought. Got you. As opposed to um, building on, like providing a foundation, right, for your thought. It's, I need to, the way it's interpreted, and and I get this because I kind of feel the same way. Um, I got to go find somebody who said it before I did. And because they said it and they wrote it down, that's what makes it valid as opposed to my lived experience bringing me to that same place. So it's not va- it's not a it's nothing wrong with the fact that like someone else did it before me. It's right. Just decide- and, and I also understand to some aspect you don't it, it's like the plagiarism aspect. You don't want to take other people's ideas. So I, I understand that. But there are some things that you would just know through like your lived experience and it can feel. Dehum- not dehumanizing. It could feel... Uh... I would say dehumanizing. Really? Yeah, because, I mean, think about it. Um, when academic first, or when academic writing, uh, when rules and stipulations to it was put in place, were put in place, um, a lot of the folks who got that first initial um, ability to create like uh, validation for what their train of thought was, we were and still currently are living in an era where tons of discrimination occurs. So as a person of color myself, it's kind of like always having to justify my trains of thoughts, my actions, my behaviors to fit within a particular mold. Say more. So we had a recent speaker. Okay. And I blank on his name, but I know you know who it is. It was during the in-service. Oh, yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Frank Franklin. Yeah. Dr. Franklin. Volunteers of America. Yeah. Right. And so Dr. Franklin, during that presentation, specifically said, you know, I have to think about, even for this presentation, I had to even think about whether I needed to cite my own research or things Um, that I intrinsically know because I'm a black man. Right. So that's what I think about with academic writing. Like there's things that I know through my experiences, but I'm being forced to cite them. So to me, it's just another occurrence of being a brown person. Gotcha. Yeah. And then being able to tie it back, like there's knowledge that's been around. Um, there's a value statement that's, uh, that's being given to knowledge that's being written down as opposed to, let's say, maybe being uh, translated orally, right? So we stuff that's written down is taken as more serious than stuff that's actually experienced or that's passed on orally. So if we, even if we look at this idea of citing, who's, who began citing? Right. right. So there were people who wrote down things originally, but they got those ideas from somewhere, right? They, they, those weren't all original ideas that they right. came up with. They just actually were the first ones to write those ideas down or write those ideas in English or in German or French or Russian or whatever the, the language happened to be. 
where some of this knowledge may have already been around for centuries, it just may have been passed on orally. Mm-hmm. Or it may have been written in a, a language that's no longer around. Um, that civilization might have been potentially destroyed. But because they weren't written down in a language that has still survived, it's not looked at as valid. Or it wasn't looked at as valid until and unless someone wrote that down in a Western language. Right. Yeah. Or at least that's the way I, I take that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I, as a scholar myself, I'd like to have um, a certain degree of, of, of liberty, of leeway mm-hmm. to be able to say something, not necessarily new, but something that doesn't need to be uh, referenced through someone else. Because I feel like, like you said, it, it's very limiting. There's tons more that we could be learning about our work in higher ed that could greatly benefit us as an institution and can greatly benefit our students or us ourselves as professionals, as employees. But oftentimes we're not even giving that liberty to talk about um, or to write about, in this case, those issues. So it's funny because it's making me think about an uh, article I read today um, in the Chronicle, Chronicle Higher Ed, and they're talking uh, to it's an interview with, I think his name is Robert Hansen. He's a, an economist. I want to say he's a George Mason. But it's part of what he, he what the article talks about a lot, but there's an aspect uh, of the article that really talks about that. He talks about the idea of like clumping, academic clumping, where mm-hmm. all of our research is kind of focused in these few, few areas. And it's focused in these few areas because academia says you have to, you have to build your knowledge, you have to cite certain sources. So what it creates is these Everyone is focused on studying the same thing. And instead, what we should be focusing on are the gaps. And so you have people who've been writing about the same thing for 100 years. Right. Why shouldn't we be looking at what may be happening, happening, could potentially happen 100 years in the future? But that's not given the same same like merit. So to be able to come, and this guy, Hanson, like, creates all these fairly like original ideas. He very much thinks outside of the box, right? The, the what ifs. And he's kind of saying, if we could focus or kind of pivot to begin looking at the, the what if and begin creating original ideas that aren't necessarily worried about citing and looking to the past. I mean, we can look to the past, but really begin to focus on kind of the future. Mm-hmm. If we could change how we write to incorporate more of that, to, to look at that as also valid, we'd be creating a lot more. We'd be moving a, a lot further along as opposed to when someone what does want to do that, right? Someone has this original idea and they go through and they cite and they look at the research that's already out. They had to create this whole research study that validates what they already know. Right. And so what if there's a way that we could, we can still do that, but we can also put emphasis on creating new ideas that aren't solely having to, uh, we don't solely have to rely on building on something that's already been, already been put out there, a foundation that's already been lit. Right. The other day you, you, or the other day we were recording the podcast, you mentioned that uh, we're in higher ed, we're really good at teaching the students of 1950. No, well, <laughs> ni- 95, but yeah, yeah. 95, yeah. sorry, of 1995. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I thought 1950s. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, but it's, um, I just, I think it's because of how we move, right? We, we take so long to do anything in higher ed. Mm-hmm. And so really it's like by the time, by the time something becomes standard practice, it's already outdated. Right. Right. And I think that, like it, it makes us stagnant. Right. So we and it was, what's crazy to me is coming into higher ed. I came into higher ed already feeling like the stuff that everyone was talking about was outdated. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why? Like, why are we still talking about like this was this was like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. This was like 20 years ago. Why are we? I was looking at Tinto like. But seriously, we're we're looking. Yeah, like that rationale or that 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 model may have worked twenty or thirty years ago. That 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 doesn't work now. Right. But people still like people will still cite that like it's like it's new. Oh yeah, I mean, in the graduate program that I'm at, we're actually learning about these theorists that you know um, historically have had made really great contributions, yeah. but there are better contributions that have been made in the recent. Uh, recent past or Mm -hmm. present day um, that oftentimes we don't study about, we don't learn about because they're not uh, research based in a sense, or they're not written down in these like academic peer reviewed journals or books. Right. And so, and so some folks might be like, well, that's just writing. Not everyone writes. You don't have to write. Yes, you're in a graduate program. So that involves the writing aspect. But besides that, you don't necessarily have to write to be an academic professional. Right. 
But the issue is that the way we look at writing and the rules that we follow within writing itself translate to the way that we do our jobs, yeah. right? So when you think about implementing new ideas, oftentimes there's this resistance to implementing something new because no one has done it before or no one that we know has done it before in the past. Yeah. So there's this fear of trying something new. Yeah, and then there's there's the other aspect or the other thing that's going on with that I see a lot, and that's that and people can't conceptualize it unless it's written in a certain way. And that's mm-hmm. something that, that uh, me and a lot of my, my colleagues experience. We create an idea or a program or whatever it happens to be, right? And that uh, we're using our experience to, to craft that. Right Now, it doesn't mean that we are also looking to see what other uh, data is out there. But a lot of it is just us being able to use our own experience, our own intersectionality, right? And understanding of the environment that we're in to create this thing that we think is going to be beneficial. But the issue with that is that in order for that to get implemented, it has to be approved. Mm -hmm. And it has to be approved a lot of times or supported. I shouldn't say approved. It has to be supported by individuals who don't have the same experience. Right. And because they don't have the same experience, they're never going to actually see it in the way that you see it. They're never going to be 100% on board. And so like for my my colleague, my colleague, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's what you should do. Um, but for someone who may be higher up, let's say, and I'm speaking in general terms, but someone who may be higher up, but someone who doesn't have that experience, they can't uh, conceptualize it unless it's written in a certain way. And writing that in a certain way means that you're taking it away from your personal experience. You're writing it in a theoretical way and you're, you're citing this research study that's been done that validates it. Right. So it's it's in this interesting way of to get back to what you were saying before. I know that it works because I know the population that I'm serving, but in order for you to understand that it works, I got to pull this research study. And and so to to paint the picture of kind of this lag time, right? Think about when that that uh when that theoretical model, think about when that was developed. Right. Right. Um that's not a recent theoretical mm-hmm. model and by recent I'm talking about like five, ten years, right? So this is this is the this is why diversity is a good thing, right? As you begin to have more diverse people in a setting, let's say academia, they begin writing about their experiences. So yes, they have to go through this rigmarole of conducting research and all these other things to be taken valid, right? But we're we're looking at the information that was presented in the nineties, in ninety five, in two thousand. Because this is, and not saying like we didn't have people of color like working in higher ed before then, we most certainly did. But as you begin to get more and more diverse people working in a setting, more of this knowledge is being generated. And if we don't place as much of an emphasis on having to go through this process, that information can get out and can be actualized, operationalized way quicker, right? So the person who may have developed that theory is how old now? They're, are they still working with students? What capacity are they working with students? They were working with students in 1990, 95, 2000. A student who started college in, in 1990 experienced a very different world than a student who started, a student of color who started in the year 2000. It assumes like the identity doesn't change, that it's stagnant. Right. Right. So what it is to be a Latino in 1990 is the same thing as it is to be Latino in 2016. Which in reality, that is not accurate. <laughs> exactly. That's the point. So if we look at it from that context, right, that that seems idiotic to assume that some, like the 18-year-old the or the, the 35-year-old in 1995 who is experiencing, you know, who is embodying a certain identity is going to be the same as someone in 2016. It doesn't make sense if you look at it in real-world terms. But if you look at it in academic terms, well, yeah, of course. Right. And so... Like we we joke about having to go to a conference to hear someone tell you that what you're doing is is right. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, that totally okay. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And it's not to uh, to discredit conferences. Um, like I know folks that go to conferences mm-hmm. and really do take good ideas from them. Um, but me individually, as as someone who's attended several um, both regional, state, and national conferences. Yeah. Oftentimes when I go, it isn't new ideas that I gathered from these workshops or trainings. 
it's it's more of a validation, like you said, a validation of the work that I'm already doing. And then the reason why I still go to these uh, to these conferences is more to hear the questions yeah. that folks have at the end of the workshops or trainings, right? Because oftentimes those questions often are same questions that I'm that I'm asking myself in the work that I'm doing. Or better yet, sometimes it's new questions that I haven't even thought about that then I could begin thinking about and trying to find solutions for those questions, yeah. right? And that's usually what I come back with is questions and then trying to figure out solutions for those questions and then implementing new ideas. I think ultimately the, the biggest thing as I see it is we, we don't move quick enough. Like we're, not, we're not nimble, right? Um, if, you look at, if you look at like Silicon Valley, if you look at a lot of these companies, they're able to, they're profitable, not that we should be seeking profit. Um, so let me try a different word. They're innovative because they value innovation, because they don't have to go through this long process of, of making sure that it's right 100% of the time, right? That they can try things. And if it works, great, we're going to move with it. If it doesn't work, that's fine too. We just found out a way that something doesn't work. Right. Uh, if we could, I think, take that approach to higher ed, I think we'd be in a better. I think we'd be in a better situation. I think we'd be able to better serve students because our world is consistently changing. Higher ed is going to be changing as a result of that. Like, let me let me put this in a different way. I think I've I've said this before about how we we're at community college, right? So if there's something that exists in the world, it exists here. Right. Right. We we can't quarantine ourselves right so whatever exists out there exists in here so we have to be responsive to that to some degree but not even just responsive we have to anticipate where society is going right and if we can anticipate where society is going if we can have that degree of forethought then we're prepared for students as they come in right as opposed to i think how we typically ask like we're responding and we're responding because we're operating off of outdated data right so instead of being proactive, we're just being reactive. Yeah, and it's impossible in many ways. It's impossible for higher ed to operate in the way that it operates and be proactive. Right. So this is kind of what we mean when we say like structural change. Like structurally, we're always looking back. We're always looking back and philosophizing. Or was it prosticating? Prognosticating? Something like that now. I don't even know words. Um, <laughs> But we're always looking to the past and talking about something, and we, we aren't looking to the future. We are action-oriented. And so then when we have like these shifts that happen in society, and then that has like a, a, an impact, positive or negative, on higher ed as an institution, like we're scrambling, right? We're trying to figure out what's going on, and it's because we spent and because we spent so much time looking behind us, as opposed to attempting to anticipate what what's coming up. Right. The other thing with with academic writing that that comes to mind is the fact that it's um, it's limiting, um, but not necessarily limiting as to who can contribute, but limiting as to who has access. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, no, it's, um, I'll go to something that you said a little bit earlier in that article that I was reading. Uh, one of the things that uh, Robin Hanson says is like, he basically, at first, he didn't really want to get a PhD. He got a PhD because he wasn't being taken seriously. Mm-hmm. Why they didn't even want to get a master's degree? I'm getting a master's degree because people don't take me seriously. Hey, truth be told, I didn't want to go to college. <laughs> so, like, yeah, I mean... I, I talked about this before. Like, I didn't want to go to college, but then, you know, I went to college and got a bachelor's degree. And now I have a master's degree, and I'm thinking about the idea of getting a PhD. But it's like I've I've heard from my colleagues, like they've gotten to a certain place, and this is a weird, this is an interesting thing. They have gotten to a certain place where they can't do anything. They can't move up unless they get what they refer to as that piece of paper, mm-hmm. right? So it's, you have these. You have this wealth of experience. You have these great and amazing ideas. You know what you're doing, and and you could be doing a job above what you're doing now, but you're you're limited, right? Because you don't have a piece of paper, right? right? And and I get it. It's not to um, be disparaging of PhD programs or MD programs, or um, you know, it's it's not to be disparaging of advanced degrees. It's just simply saying. Again, this is worship of the written word, right? Um, 
you can still just because you have a degree doesn't make you smart. Like one of my one of my mentors in grad school always said, you know, a PhD just means that you have some sense of dedication. He's like, you don't have to be smart to get a PhD. Right. He was saying, like, I, he he's like, I'm not that smart. He's like, really, genuinely, I am not a very smart person. I'm just really persistent. So I was willing to grind out five years to get a PhD, but it wasn't necessarily that I'm any smarter than anybody else in this room. He's like, I was just willing to grind that out. And I had the financial resources to do it. So like you brought up the point of uh, of having the, the finances to go and get a PhD, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and in higher ed, that often is the case for, for everyone, for many, many folks is um, having to deal with having finances to even pursue higher education, mm-hmm. right? So thinking about like a bachelor's degree and they're saying now that a bachelor's degree is the equivalent of like a high school degree <clears throat> decades back because yeah. a lot of people have them now. Right. Yeah. So now folks are being, um, are being told to go and get a master's degree. Well, that involves another degree of funding to pay for a master's degree. And then if you're also having to go and get a PhD, well, then that's an additional barrier there. And yeah. so when we're talking about like, um, who has access and who doesn't well historically speaking there's a lot of folks who are, come from marginalized uh, identities who don't have access yeah. because there was purposeful intent to prevent folks from having access yeah so it sucks yeah it does um it reminds me of a conversation i was having i want to say it was friday with uh how these two folks came in and you know, we were having a conversation uh, really really like bright individuals uh, and they're pursuing their degree uh, here they get in, I believe they get in their associates so I think they may be in the, both in the drug and alcohol program but we're having this conversation there's um, there's stuff that they're saying there's there's knowledge that these individuals have and I'm sitting here thinking to myself you y'all should be teaching in some capacity and they're getting their uh, certificate or getting their associates and so mm-hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, there's creative things that we can do, uh, right? We can have presentations and we can bring people like that in who have this lived experience um, and that they can they can educate in a way. But the the idea that someone who has, who's gone off and maybe studied in these alternate channels or someone who is coming in with uh, like this lived experience that we don't have here, it's a gap, right? Right. Um, that those people can't contribute until they get that piece of paper. Like there's... That's also where we're we're not being as efficient as we could be. Yeah. So then it becomes really interesting. And I, I can see this trying to say something. It becomes really interesting. We we talk about gaps, right? And we talk about gaps in serving uh, folks, serving students. And then we have situations like that where we know there's this gap. We have individuals who can help address that gap, but we devalue the experience that they have. And so we don't create a space for them to come in and help us help students. Right. So the thing that I was thinking about as you were talking, it reminded me of actually a philosopher, Dewey. Hmm. Um, So Dewey, one of his state or one of their statements is essentially saying that in order for students to better learn, better retain knowledge and better be able to apply that knowledge, they need to incorporate that knowledge into a lived experience. Yes. Right. So the reason why I kind of started laughing as you were talking or giggling to myself was because... (laughs) you don't ever think to abide by that particular statement. Like the, the value of a lived experience isn't, isn't incorporated really into higher ed. No. Um, so it's funny to me to think like there's this theory us that we often cite and that we often reference when we're trying to implement things, but we don't take um, theorists own like information to apply for ourselves. Well, we sure pick information, right? So we pick the, we grab the information that we think is going to prove our point And then we dismiss the information that we, Right. Um, and so, especially like there's a, a if there's a way of thinking, we're going to grab the information that supports that way of thinking, even if it's not our opinion. It's just the way in which we're structured, how we think. It's that, like it's how, how it is that we, we think. And so when we have information that, um, that doesn't fit that, uh, it gets dismissed. It, again, it kind of reminds me of this, this article. Right. Um, and, and I say that it reminds me of this article because 
there's stuff in there, right? There's stuff that like when you're talking to people who think in a different way, they will say things and then you'll pick it up later. So uh, I'm saying that to say like this article, when we start changing kind of how we think and how we operate, there's a lot of stuff about equity and inclusion that people will go like, oh, that's what they were talking about. But because we're kind of confined in how we think, it's going right over their head. Right. It just reminded me of, um, so a paper topic that I've been working on is how oftentimes marginalized students um, go to seek resources from departments and because they're seen as like a person of color or someone who identifies as LGBT or et cetera, they're actually sent over to like the Queer Resource Center, oh the Multicultural God. Center, yeah. somebody else, right, to yeah. like seek financial aid help, advising, et cetera, even though they're in the financial aid office or the advising office. Yeah, true story. <clears throat> so... My paper essentially is addressing that issue of like, you can't, you can't do that to students because in a reality, it's, it's saying to the student, you're not worth my time. Yeah. And then there's another thing that's being say, that's being communicated, which is um, you can only be helped there. Right. And, exactly. And that's, that's kind of the crazy thing. Like, you know, this is supposed to be an equitable, it is supposed to be an inclusive environment. It doesn't matter where I go. I should be able to receive support, assistance, whatever it is, anywhere else. Like, ultimately, cat out the bag, multicultural centers shouldn't have to exist. Not that they shouldn't exist. They shouldn't have to exist. If institutions are truly operating in, a, in an equitable and inclusive way, you wouldn't have multicultural centers. Right. Why wouldn't you have multicultural centers? Because regardless of where students went on a campus – their experience would be valued. Right. Right. Um, regardless of what class they went into, the classes would be taught in such a way that understood their lived experience, understood their ways of, of learning and taking in information, and it would be crafted to that. Right. Um, that is how we would educate. That's how we would serve individuals. So the idea of a, a queer resource center or a women's resource center or any of those things, it wouldn't it wouldn't need to exist because we would already be talking about the issues that that face students, the students serve. Right. Right. But that being said, look at our campus climate survey. Our campus climate survey says that the vast majority of folks don't think their job should change in any way as a community or as this institution becomes more diverse. Right. So think about really what that means. I'm sitting in a classroom. My job is to teach. But as different people, more and more different people come in, I, I just do what I do. Right. That's interesting to me because there's assumptions that I can make about that. I can assume that that you believe that everyone is the same. Mm hmm. Now, we know factually that is not true. We know that's not true. We know there are different learning styles. We know people coming in at different points. But okay, I'll buy that. You're saying that everyone is the same. Or you're saying it doesn't matter that people are different and they learn different and they're coming in with different experiences. Like that's, that's not what's important. It's important that they adapt to me. And if that's your perspective, okay. But it also tells me that you don't actually care about teaching. You care about talking. Or you, the subject area. You care about the subject area. You care about conveying information. You don't care about being understood. And I think that's, if that's where you're at, great. But you'll, you'll always have a gap, mm -hmm. right? If the idea for looking at teaching, right, being able to instill knowledge, you have to be willing and able to cater that message in a way that is going to be understood. But if the idea is just that I don't ever need to change, the way I communicate information is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're always going to have, you're always going to have a gap, right? You're always going to be limited, I should say, in your ability to do your job effectively and as the students that you serve become more diverse, you are going to be less effective in right. doing your job. Right. So the re to tie it back to uh, academic writing, the reason why I brought this Because um, we're all over up. the place. <laughs> I know, Rihanna, we're all over the place. <laughs> so to tie it back to academic writing, the reason why I brought this up was because this is the focus of one of my research, or one of my, not research papers, one of my papers, right? And... Um, my issue was that regardless of how much I was researching, there isn't actually a ton of academic peer-reviewed 
articles or books on this particular area, yeah. right? So then my train of thought was, oh, shoot, now I'm going to have to change my subject because someone hasn't like done a study about it before, Clumping. right? Right. But then I was speaking um, to a professor and they, they essentially gave me a cheat <laughs> way around that which I thought was funny because <laughs> it's kind of like finding a means to cope with something that you know is like impeding an area of study. The workaround. Right? People of color and people doing this work, we are very familiar with workarounds. Right. And so the suggestion that was given to me was like, okay, so if multicultural centers or um, you know queer resource centers or et cetera aren't their their purpose isn't necessarily to uh, provide all these services for marginalized groups mm-hmm. like advising financial aid uh registrar's office etc yeah. right then the way you can justify your argument is by proving that that's not what they're supposed to do so proving what is it that they actually do yeah. does that make sense no, no no it makes perfect sense to me so it's a way going around <laughs> everything but in reality in my mind i was like okay well i i can do that because I have the information and I know like folks that have done that research. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's it takes so much more time to get to a point that I already know is happening. I know that yeah. this is happening on college campuses. So having to like prove that a center is not supposed to be doing this yeah. to then explain like what is actually happening, the actual point of my paper, yeah. like that that seems really wrong <laughs> yeah. okay so there's two things there. so one i agree with you i think it gets we're talking about efficiency right mm-hmm. and this is where we could be taking a, a cue from smart innovative businesses it is not an efficient use of your time to have to do that right right if we could come to the understanding that this is the mc should be doing this so they shouldn't be doing it then that allows you more time to actually focus on expanding knowledge right so there's that. But then there's the other thing, at least it's in regards to what you said, and this is something that's big. It also assumes that that MCs are or should be doing the same thing. Right. Regardless of institution. And I know that fundamentally not to be true. No, it's also, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because the research that I've been doing, um, and one of the, the leading folks that does research on cultural centers and multicultural centers is Patton. Okay. Lori Patton. Yeah. Um, and so they have done extensive research, um, but the research in itself seems to not necessarily encompass um, what I call the new model, mm-hmm. um, which is technically the one that we function under, right? And so then it's me having to create a paper uh, under a model that's... Uh, I don't think where we're at anymore. At least us as a as a, yeah. as a college, I don't think we're at anymore. Yeah. Um, and so then, <laughs> not being able to contribute like how we operate as mm-hmm. a center um, and why we operate in this way is kind of it's kind of really uh, limiting, sad in a sense. Because I would love to be able to contribute that. Like I think uh, my peers that I'm in the program with, or other folks who are in graduate programs who just want to study about cultural centers, like, I think it's useful information, but I can't put it in there. I agree with you. Um, and this is actually something that I've had a lot of conversations uh, about with some of my peers, because I think some of them are like, oh, my God, you're finally able to actually do what, like, what we're supposed to be doing. And there are some who, there's some who are out there who are able to operate in that way. And then there's some who's like, I would love to be able to do that, but that just that's not the reality and it's not the reality because it's not the reality because there is not uh how do i say this i'll use an analogy because you know i like using analogies right um lebron james is a great basketball player love the guy hate the guy he's a great basketball player but lebron james is only as good as the people who are around him so if you go back and you look at some of those early Cleveland teams, he's able to take those teams to the finals. He didn't win. Why? He was playing against a better team. So as great as he is as an individual, he's limited because he didn't have a team that could support him. Right. So we can look at his success now, recently, last year, he's supported by a much better cast of characters. He is in a system that allows him to be really good. Um, I'm using LeBron James as an example, but I think that my my sports fans out there can look at 
look at great systems, right? And people who were able to experience a great deal of success in a system, and then they move somewhere else and they're not able to be as successful. Why? It's a different system. What does that have to do with what I'm talking about? What it has to do with is you can be doing this work in the way that we're doing it, but if you're on a campus and you're working with individuals, your supporting cast isn't supportive of it, if they don't understand it, if they're not ready for it, you can't be effective. So you can try to do this work, but it's only going to be isolating. You're not going to have the reach that you want. You're going to just spend more of your time like combating resistance mm-hmm. because you don't have an environment. You're not in a system that's supportive of it. So if you really want, we've experienced a pretty good degree of success in doing what we're doing and how we're doing it because we're in a system that allows for that. Oh, no, very much so. I very much agree with you. I think about it, um, you know, future wise, not 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 recent future or not, you know, happening anytime soon. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think about it, like the 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 possibility of further on in my career, switching institutions, going somewhere else and thinking about how how the culture, how the system Mm -hmm. there might be and the limitations that the system might create or the opportunities that the system might create. Us as a center, we're in a very uh, privileged position within the institution we're at yeah. um, because of the system that we're at um, and the folks that enable us or that allow us really um, support is a better answer yeah. and that support us in the work that we're doing. But like you said, other institutions like that, that isn't the case. So if we tie it back to to the articles, to the peer review academic writing, um, like having kind of a, a precedence. So if I'm able to write about the system that we work in and how it functions and what the outcomes are, right, and the systemic change that it creates, if I'm able to write about that and other folks are able to read about that and then explain and reference, right, yeah. explain to their superiors or to the senior administrators, whatever, uh, reference this particular, like, model mm-hmm. of operating, it, it does create that legitimacy of, oh, maybe we should be operating in that way. And it allows folks to really, really do their job. Yeah. And the, and the key thing that I take from what you said there is that it's not even necessarily, it's not even necessarily, it's not what the multicultural center should be doing. You're having to write about how the, how the campus should look. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what I mean by like the idea of like efficiency is now it's inefficient in that I have to explain how the campus has to look like how you have to be structured in order for this to be as effective and efficient as possible. Right. Right. And I think that's what gets lost is that the the emphasis is always and we can expand this uh, conversation out. The emphasis is always on the individual. Yep. Right. So whether we're talking about like a multicultural center, whether we're talking about uh, students of color, uh, queer identified students, it's always the emphasis on the individual to change or to um, exceed expectation or to overcome obstacles. It's never on, well, why, why should an individual have to overcome obstacles? Like, why are those obstacles there? That's a better question. Right. Mm-hmm. So if we're looking at how our institution is structured, our, is our institution structured in such a way that it just inherently presents obstacles? If we could get the institution to have less obstacles, our students would have to overcome less obstacles, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So to kind of get to what you're saying, you have to create or you have to write about what the institution has to look like, provide that context, and then talk mm-hmm. about, okay, so and then once this is done, this is how an uh, MC is supposed to function. Right. Right. And so, right. But right now, what very much happens, and I've I've seen this at every institution I've ever been to. The focus is always on the center, the individuals in the center, mm-hmm. to be amazing, to be great, to exceed expectation. But what do we know, right? What we know, at least what I know from experience, and maybe this is we got to write more about this. This might be one of those gaps in the research that we talk about. What I know is that that person is not always going to be there. And then when that person leaves, someone else has to come. And that person, it takes so long for that person to 
build momentum and get back up to the point where the previous person was. What does that say to me as someone who looks at systems? It says that you're putting this emphasis on the individual and instead of a person being able to come in and pick up the momentum and push push things forward, move it further down the field, instead what's happening is that all that momentum is lost as soon as you lose that person. You're putting too much focus on the individual. If you got a great system and you bring in a great individual, you just you win. You go you go much further. Right. But if you got a great person in a bad system, what is it Tim Wise says like a, a a bad person can only do so much bad in a good system, and a good person can only do so much good in a bad system. Right. That's true. So I think we're out of time. Yeah, we are. Do we have any announcements today? So we do have some announcements. We have Sarah Gold Rob, Dr. Sarah Gold Rob, who's going to be speaking this evening uh, in the MEHB Auditorium. She's going to be talking about her new book, which looks at affordability in higher education. Uh, that is going to be, again, 6.30 p.m. in the MEHB Auditorium. So also, we have Alexander McPherson, our coordinator for the Equity and Empowerment Corps program. He is still recruiting for mentors. For those of you who are at the Cascade campus, if you actually go to your announcements page, there's more information about that program. Please feel free if you've got some folks who are interested in mentoring, if you're interested in mentoring yourself, contact Alexander, see if we can get you signed up. That program is going to be a mentoring program or a partnership, I should say, between PCC Cascade and Roosevelt High School. So, again, we are looking for some folks to participate in that program. All right. So I think that that is all of our, our announcements for today. Um, we will see you again on Thursday. And so this is Elizabeth Guzman Arroyo. This is Luke Gibbons saying, so what if it's true?